Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Pick. I'm one of the tissue viability nurse advisors for Coloplast. I've got my uh, colleague Sam Wharton here with me tonight. Uh, she's going to be manning the chat. So if you've got any questions, please just um, put, pop them in the chat and, and Sam um, will get back to you. I've also got my colleague Ellen Buckley on as well, and she can answer your questions in the chat too. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get started. OK, so you're joining us this evening um, and we're going to discuss how to assess, prepare and treat um, a wound with an infection. And hopefully this will make your lives a little bit easier as healthcare professionals. But ultimately, this will make your patient's life easier. So during today's session, we're going to look at a, a simplified approach to wound healing. Um, we'll understand the impact of wound infection and biofilms and discuss how um, how we can manage those. We're going to look at the overview of the latest principles of breast practice from the International Wound Infection Institute, and we will look at the um, wound infection continuum. And then you will leave with the Coloplast three-step approach wound infection pathway that will help to simplify and support your practice. As I said, if you've got any questions, please do pop them in the chat and my colleagues will answer them as we go along. Get the next slide. I'm just going to stop sharing and I'm going to share again because it decided not to work. There, there we go. Sorry about that. So there is a huge burden of wounds um, and wound infection and biofilm uh, will be a massive part of that. Uh, as NHS or healthcare professionals, you are managing 3.8 million patients um, per year with a wound, which is a phenomenal amount of people. 3.8 million is a huge amount of people with wounds that you are managing. And the, that on annual cost of managing wounds um, was estimated to be around 2.7 billion pound compared with that 5.6 billion for the 30% of wounds that didn't heal. So we are spending an awful lot of money on wounds in general, but for wounds that aren't healing, we are spending over double the amount. So it's estimated that 59% of chronic wounds healed if there was no evidence of infection. However, that is then compared with 45% if there was a definite or suspected infection. Now, the prevalence of biofilm in chronic wounds may be greater than 80%, and actually what we're probably looking at is 80 to 100% of wounds that are hard to heal will contain a biofilm. Now, there was a survey done, and 46% of healthcare professionals believe that infection is a challenge when treating wounds, and quite often that challenge is um, related to a fear um, and a, a fear of not doing enough for that patient, a fear of that patient becoming systemically unwell, um, and perhaps we are introducing antibiotics much sooner than we really need to. And we'll explore that a little bit throughout this. So the clinical, clinical relevance of wound infection, it's a very common wound complication and is often quite difficult to identify. So as I said previously, 80 to 100 percent of wounds are contaminated with microorganisms. So all of your wounds that you will be looking after are contaminated with microorganisms. Not all of these microorganisms are going to cause us a problem and not all of them are going to cause an infection. So wound infection will occur when those microorganisms or that bacteria moves deeper into the wound tissue and it proliferates. So it multiplies. And that's what leads to local spreading or systemic immune response for these patients. Now, the host or the patient's immune system and the species of bacteria will influence the development of that wound infection. So it depends what's going on with your patient, how good their immune system is and what bacteria is in that wound. 
as to how that patient is going to react to those microorganisms in that wound bed. Now, infection has a, it can have massive implications for the patient. And some of those, um, which I'm sure all of you are seeing in on your caseloads and the patients that you're looking after is that there can be delayed wound healing. Now, I'm sure you've all had patients on your caseloads for months, if not some of them for years on end. And this could be related to biofilm formation and has not been able to disrupt that bacteria enough to try and move that wound into the healing phase. So the patient's quality of life can also be adversely impacted. With wound infection comes an increase in visits. So it could be that the patient's having to go to the practice nurse more frequently. It could be that they're having to wait for the community nurses to visit more frequently. Or it could be that even a family member is having to come and, and change those dressings for them. The exudate and the smell that are associated with wound infection can, can really have a, a horrible impact on those patients. Uh, I had a lady that had a, a leg ulcer who got infected and unfortunately um, was asked to leave the local cafe that she visited because of the smell of her wound. Now, not only was that incredibly embarrassing for that lady, but it also impacted her mental health because she then didn't want to leave her home. And that's not something that we want to encourage with our patients. We need them to stay as active as possible. Of course, with the um, increase of infection in a wound, there are treatment costs rise. So as I said, there will be more visits required. There will be dressings, more different dressings or more dressings that may be required because you're having to change that um, wound dressing so frequently. But also antimicrobial dressings we know are slightly more expensive than our normal dressings. And our wound management practices become far more resource demanding. So as I said, you are going to have to have more visits if you have a wound that is infected, which means that more nursing time is used up looking after these patients that have a wound infection. So it's really important that we remember about our holistic approach to our patient, about doing that full holistic assessment and early intervention, because that might be able to help us avoid um, wound infection from, from occurring. So here at Coloplast, we have the three-step approach. And the idea of this three-step approach is to help you simplify your wound healing for your patients. It's an easy three steps that you can remember, and this you can you can use this on any of your patients with a wound. So your step one is around assessment, and this is your full holistic assessment of your patient, looking at any underlying um, comorbidities that they may have looking at their age, at their diet, et cetera, et cetera. You're looking at that patient as a whole. And then you will also look at the, the wound or the hole in the patient. And you can use um, a, a, a holistic wound care framework, such as the Triangle of Wound Assessment, that allows the um, healthcare professionals to assess and manage all areas of the wound, including that wound edge and that peri-wound skin, because it's really important that we remember all three aspects of that wound. Once you've done a really um, robust holistic assessment, you'd then move on to step two, which is preparation. Now, wound preparation might be a new concept to some people. This is um, otherwise known as cleansing and debridement. Again, this is quite a holistic approach, wound preparation, and it is key to removing those barriers to healing. It helps us to get rid of any of the devitalized tissue in the wound. Um, it helps us to um, to remove or reduce those um, bacteria that sat in that wound bed, such as biofilm, and helps us to reduce um, the, the risk of infection, really. And it creates that optimum healing environment for the patient. So if we do a really good preparation, this is going to help with our treatment selection. Now, after you've done preparation, you might do a slight reassessment because you might have a better, you might have a better view of that wound um, after you've removed some of those barriers. But your third step is then for treat is is treat or your treatment. And this is where you will look at your portfolio of dressings, whatever is available to you on your formulary to be able to manage the wound, um, no matter what depth or stage of healing that it's at. And when you've done your your treatment, you will then go back to step one and do your reassessment each time you review this patient. And if you remember these three steps every time you're reviewing your patient, this will stand you in good stead to help you simplify that wound healing approach for your patient. So we're going to look at assessment first. Now, the, the aims of wound assessment is ultimately to identify that cause of the skin breakdown. So why has that patient got the wound in the first place? 
And by doing your wound assessment and, and your holistic assessment, you'll be able to identify any associated risk factors for the patient, what their underlying comorbidities are and are they posing a risk to helping that wound to heal, which will help you decide whether you need to correct or treat any of those underlying causes. If we think about patients with diabetes, if their blood sugars aren't well controlled, then this we know that diabetic patients already are at higher risk of infection and this will only put them at a higher risk. So we need to make sure that we correct or treat that underlying um, high blood sugar and look at the reasons why their blood sugars are so high. W um, wound assessment and holistic assessment will help you to identify those um, management goals, what it is that you're actually trying to do for that wound. And it will also help you to identify the patient's expectations. And this, this whole um, holistic assessment is about having really good lines of communication with your patient to make sure they fully understand what is going on with their body, with their wound, and what your aims are and how you're trying to help them progress to healing. So frequency of wound assessment um, will really depend on the condition of your patient, the condition of their wound and the care setting that they are in. But ultimately, it's down to you as their clinician. A holistic assessment um, would or should be as a minimum every two weeks in an acute assessment, uh, in acute setting, sorry, and every four weeks within a primary care and community setting. But this might change if your patient's condition changes, if their wound changes, you might need to do this more frequently. So again, it's down to your clinical judgment as well. It's really important when you're carrying out your holistic assessment to make sure that you are listening to your patient. So ask them lots of questions, but actively listen to the answers that they are giving you because they are the best person to give you their history. They know themselves better than anybody does, any healthcare professional or any um, documentation that's already been, been made on that patient. So it's really important to take a thorough history from that patient. And within this, you need to think about their medications and make sure that you record all the current medications that they are actually taking, whether they are prescribed for that patient or not. Think about your elderly patients. Quite often um, they are um, prescribed paracetamol, but how many of them actually take it? And what they will say to you is, oh, well, I, I only wait till I'm really in pain nurse before I actually take the paracetamol. So it's about that education of why we need them to take that paracetamol on a regular basis, because we don't want to try and get on top of the pain once they're in pain. We need to get on top of it before they get to that, that point. Once you've done your listening and, and, and having those lines of communication with your patient, you're going to be looking at them and you will start looking at them the minute you either walk through their door or they walk through yours. You'll be looking at their age, their body weight, how they mobilise, whether they're able to mobilise independently, whether they've got someone with them to help with their, their mobility or whether they're using furniture and the walls to help guide them. You'll look at um, their clinical observations and you will look at whether how their blood pressure is, how their heart rate is, looking at their oxygen saturations. All of these will give you that bigger picture. And before you look at the wound, itself before you take that dressing off you will be looking at the surrounding skin you'll be looking at that limb to see whether there's any edema in that limb if it looks the same as the other one if they've got any dry skin or if they've got any skin conditions and then you'll be looking at the dressing to see if there is any exudate that you can see coming out of the dressing or on the dressing before you've even removed that you need to make sure that you do a top to toe skin assessment because that will help you confirm or change what your diagnosis and or your treatment plans may be. But things to look out for when you're doing your top to toe skin assessment, as I just alluded to, with skin dryness, dehydration, could be moisture or maceration at the wound edges or on that peri wound skin. If you're looking at lower limbs, it's really important that you're looking at pulses and whether they're present or absent. Um, for patients that you suspect might have a leg ulcer or even a diabetic foot ulcer and our diabetic patients, we should be checking their pulses anyway. You need to think about the pain that the patient might be in. Are they having to take regular analgesia or are they not taking any at all? And if they're not, why is that? Um, and you need to think about whether you think there may be any infection in that wound and look at what the signs and symptoms for that infection could be. Has your patient actually got a temperature and why have they got that temperature? Is it related to the, to the wound that they have got? 
Now, odour is really undervalued during skin assessment. And actually, it's something that we we all um, are able to smell the wounds probably more frequently than we'd quite like to, actually, um, when we're when we're dealing with our patients with wounds. But it's really important to make sure that you use your sense of smell um, sensitively. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's really difficult. I had a patient with a diabetic foot ulcer and um, he had an, a necrotic plug of tissue and that wound smelt like cheese and onion crisps. And that's the only way that I can um, explain that to you. Safe to say I didn't eat my cheese and onion crisps after seeing this patient from my lunch. However, you've got to make sure that you can try and keep a, uh, you know, a very um, straight face and don't let the patient see that you can smell their wound. You can have a conversation about the odour and, and speak to them about whether they can smell it and how they feel about it and what you can then do to try and reduce that odour for the patient. But when odour can also reveal quite a few things, um, it can um, um, allude to the person's hygiene. Um, we had a gentleman that uh, we were doing bilateral um, leg dressings on and every time he came his bandages were soaked in urine and he swore blind that he had no problems with incontinence and after lots of conversations with this gentleman um, and we talked about trying pads it was very difficult and it took many months for him to actually admit that he had a problem because for him that was really embarrassing but it's about again opening those lines of communication letting the patient know that it's okay it's okay to talk about the issues that they're having, whether it's related to their legs or whether it's related to their continence or, or something else. Um, the wound exudate can tell you an awful lot, whether it's thin and watery, whether it's thick and purulent like pus, that can tell you an awful lot with what's going on with that wound, whether it's blood stained or whether it isn't. If there is necrosis and slough in that wound, that can cause an odour and also malignancy. But you need to be making sure that you're speaking to your patient throughout this and finding out what effect that is having on your patient. So the triangle of wound assessment um, is, again, a nice, easy, simple framework to help you when you're looking at your wound. And it helps you assess and manage all areas of that wound. So you'll notice the circle around the patient. This is symbolising your holistic assessment of your patient. So their age, their lifestyle, their comorbidities, their socioeconomic factors, where they live, where they work. And then it breaks it down into three areas, your wound bed, your wound edge and your peri wound skin. And each area is just as important as the other. And we're very good at clinicians at looking at the wound bed. But sometimes we forget about the wound edge and that surrounding skin. And they're just as important as what's going on in that wound bed for that patient. So this is just a simple, a simple simplified um, assessment framework that can help you when you're looking at your wounds. So your wound bed assessment, when you're looking at this, you'll be looking at what type of tissue is in your wound bed. So is it necrotic? Is it black? Is it hard? Is it soft? Is there any sluffy tissue, that yellowy tissue that can look quite fibrous sometimes? It can be quite thick or it can be quite thin. Is the tissue in the wound bed actually granulating? And is it nice and healthy? Is it that ready colour that we want it to be? Or is it quite dark and dusky? And then, of course, what we're, what we're really looking for when we're looking at our wounds is that epithelializing tissue. Um, is that wound bed starting to contract and is it starting on its healing journey? You need to think about your exudate, as we, saw, as we mentioned earlier. Think about the volume. Is it dry, that wound bed, or is it low, medium or high? And what is the consistency? Is it thin or watery or is it thick? Is it purulent? Is it... Does it look like pus or is it blood stained? And that comes into your colour as well. Is it clear, cloudy or pink or red? Because your exudate can tell you a lot about what's going on in your wound. Now, your signs and symptoms for your wound bed um, assessment for local infections. So you, is the patient had increase in pain or any erythema? So is there any redness around that wound bed? Have they all of a sudden got some edema around that wound that they didn't have before? Is there any warmth? Or is there any increased exudate? Quite often with wounds that are infected, there is a delayed healing, so that wound isn't doing as you would expect it to do. The granulation tissue, that pink, pinky ready tissue in the wound bed, could be very friable and bleeds very easily. There could be malodor and there could be um, pocketing. 
the, your spreading or systemic signs of infection will be increased erythema. So that's spreading er erythema around that wound bed. Your patient might have a temperature. They could be developing an abscess or that could be leak the wound could be leaking pus. And the wound will probably be breaking down. It's not doing as you would expect it to do. It's not static. It, it's, it's, it's getting worse. There could be a cellulitis, so that's spreading erythema at the limb. There could be a general malaise of the patient. So they could be telling you that they feel generally unwell. Um, it could be like flu-like symptoms and they can't necessarily put their finger on why they're not feeling very well. If you've done some blood tests, they could have a raised white blood cell count. Um, so there's lots of things there that you need to be thinking about when you're looking at your wound bed and, and the signs and symptoms for infection. Your wound edge assessment. So you'll be looking at whether that wound bed, that wound edge, sorry, is um, macerated. So is it a bit wet and boggy at that the edges? You know, we need a nice, healthy wound edge to allow those epithelial cells to migrate across that wound bed. And if it's very wet or it's very dry, that's going to be very difficult for the epithelial cells to do that. Does your wound have any undermining? Or is there any rolled edges? And are those rolled edges causing you concern? Could it be that there is some sort of malignancy here? Or could it be that this wound is so chronic that those rolled edges actually need removing surgically to help that wound start again from that wound edge, if you like? The peri wound skin is, as I said, just as important as the wound bed and the wound edge. So it could be that your um, surrounding skin is macerated and that could be because the dressings that you're applying aren't able to manage that exudate appropriately. It could be that there is some excoriation around that wound and that that could be from dry skin. It could be as um, an allergy from the dressing that's being used. Um, there could be hyperkeratosis. Now, I'm sure you've all seen hyperkeratotic skin. Um, that massive buildup of dry skin um, that all community nurses like to give a good scrub and pick, I'm sure. Um, callus formation often found with patients with diabetic feet. If you've got a callus, that wound edge isn't healthy. That peri wound skin isn't healthy. So we need to try and remove that callus to help with that wound healing. And it could be that the patient has eczema. So they have varicose eczema. Are you concerned about their lower limb? And we these are all things that we need to look out for and correct on that surrounding skin. Because if our surrounding skin isn't healthy, that's not going to help with our wound healing for the wound bed and the wound edge. So who is at risk of, of, a, of a wound infection? Well, ultimately, everyone. Everyone is at, at risk of um, developing a wound and everyone is at risk of developing a wound infection. But there are going to people, be people that are more at risk of a wound infection. And the individual um, risk factors are patients are patients with diabetes and their poorly controlled blood sugars. Um, it could be patients' medications, so it could be that they're on steroids or immunosuppressants. Um, it could be to do with um, poor tissue perfusion. If you're not getting an adequate blood supply to that area, that wound is not going to heal no matter what you do. So we need to make sure that we have good tissue perfusion to enable that wound to heal. Um, it could be due to malnutrition. And when you think of malnutrition, don't just think about your patients that are undernourished. You need to think about your patients that are overnourished too, um, because they're not getting the, the, the right um, protein energies that they need. And of course, alcohol, smoking and drug abuse is, is always going to factor into an increase in wound infection. Now, the environmental factors. Oh, we've gone a bit too quickly there. Sorry. Hospitalisation. Lots of bugs floating around in hospitals, lots of different people. So this, that's definitely going to be a risk factor. Unhygienic environments. Um, I'm sure anybody that's joined us from the community um, can uh, can think of a patient that they have they visit with a very unhygienic environment. Poor hygiene and aseptic technique. Now that can come from healthcare professionals and all the patients. If they're looking after their own wound, it's really important that we try and keep the procedure as aseptic as possible. If not, um, we ca if we can't do aseptic, then it, it needs to be as clean as it possibly can. Um, repeated trauma can increase that um, wound infection, such as inappropriate dressing removals um, or changing your dressings too, too frequently. Does that you need to think about whether that actually needs to be changed that frequently? Could we be leaving our dressings in place a little bit longer? 
So the characteristics which predispose um, a wound to infection are split into um, three sort of areas. And these are the risk factors for acute wounds, chronic wounds, and then both. So your um, things that you need to look for in both your wounds is necrotic tissue or foreign bodies, your impaired tissue perfusion, as we discussed earlier. So we need to think about whether the, there is an adequate blood supply there and think about your increased exudate or moisture. Your acute wounds, think about your operative procedures. So it could be that um, a patient has had um, colorectal surgery. This isn't a particularly clean um, procedure. So you need to think about um, how you're going to look after that wound after, after the procedure's taken place. Um, it could be trauma with delayed treatment. So think about your patients that have a skin tear at home and are trying to manage that on their own, um, whether it be with antiseptic creams or um, a plaster from the local Tesco's um, before they, long before they come and see you. And, and usually once they've got to see you, that wound is already infected. Your chronic wounds depends on that degree of chronicity for that, for that wound, the size and or the depth of that wound and whereabouts that wound is. So think about your patients that have got pressure ulcers to their buttocks, their sacral area. It's not a clean area, so it's difficult to keep that wound um, clean. So the stages of wound infection, um, there are five stages to the wound infection continuum. All wounds will sit on this continuum all the way through their wound healing process. Now, contamination and colonisation, we all wounds, as we've already said, are contaminated. So all wounds are going to harbour bacteria. But contamination and colonisation doesn't um, cause the host or the patient problems because our, our immune system is able to fight them off. It's when we get to local infection, spreading infection and systemic infection that we have, that, that the problems um, occur for us. And biofilm then will sit between your local infection and your systemic infection. And we're going to go through these in a little bit more detail. So your local infection is where your microorganisms or your bacteria will start to multiply and move deeper into that wound bed. And this causes um, a host response from the patient or from the patient's immune system. Now that response is generally localised um, to that, that location, that system or structure. So in this case, it will be localised to that wound. And those microorganisms or that bacteria are multiplying. Um, they're not multiplying as quickly as they are when you're in a spread in infection or systemic infection, but they are starting to multiply and it is starting to cause that patient a problem. Now, the signs and symptoms can start quite subtly, but they may develop into those classic symptoms of infection. And we've um, alluded to this earlier, but those subtle in symptoms are your hypergranulation, your bleeding to your um, granulation tissue. Wound breakdown, delayed healing, increased malodor and pain. And your classic symptoms is um, that spread, that erythema. So that redness, there can be heat to that redness as well. Um, there can be swelling or edema uh, surrounding that wound. There could be pussy type discharge. There will be delayed wound healing. And again, there will be, or pa the patient might um, say that their pain has increased and there's now a, a smell coming from that wound. Spreading infection. So this is when your bacteria are present within that wound and they're starting to multiply at greater rates and invading those surrounding tissues. Um, so this, this, they're getting past that sort of two centimetre border of that wound edge and um, are starting to affect the surrounding tissues. And your patient here will show the subtle and classic symptoms of wound infection, but they may also start developing those early systemic infection indicators. So they might have a temperature, they might be um, suffering some malaise and, and telling you that they're actually not feeling very well. They've got flu -y type symptoms. And this is where you need to be thinking about doing um, your observations for your patient um, and seeing what else is going on for them. And then we move on to your systemic infection. Now, this is not where we want to be with our patients that have got a wound. This is where your um, systemic infection starts to affect the, the body as a whole. And those microorganisms will start spreading throughout the body via the, the vascular or the lymphatic system. And the signs and symptoms of infection, um, a systemic infection are sepsis, organ dysfunction or that system, systemic inflammatory response. And this is where we need to be thinking about getting our patients into hospital because they need more um, medical support 
um, as, as well as their, their wound um, management plan. And then biofilm, pesky little microorganisms that have a genetic diversity. So they, all, they almost have like um, an armour surrounding them that creates, helps to create that chronic infection. So not only are they clustered together and able to protect themselves, they almost like have lots of armour or umbrellas covering them um, and protecting them from whatever it is that we're trying to do. They're not visible to the eye, but signs of infection indicate presence of biofilm. Um, and so quite often, if you have got a wound that isn't progressing as it should do, but you don't think it has a local infection, it could be that you've got a biofilm that you need to manage in these patients. So your microorganisms in your wounds, are, um, the two most common are your pseudomonas. So it's a gram negative microorganism and this likes to reside deep in the wound tissue. It's a keen biofilm former and 52.2% of chronic leg ulcers will contain um, pseudomonas. Now I'm sure you've all seen and smelt pseudomonas, you will smell it before you see it, but it also has that lovely green tinge. I think it's a beautiful colour, um, uh, but you will notice that that wound bed has a lovely green tinge to it. And um, pseudomonas tends to like larger wounds. So your leg ulcers that may span the, the whole circumference of the leg are an, the perfect place for it. And they like the slower healing rates. Um, and then you have your Staphylococcus aureus or your MRSA, as we probably know it. Uh, this is a gram positive bacteria. It's prominent human pathogen. It's a keen biofilm former again. Um, and it ranges from minor self-limited skin to invasive life-threatening infections. And 30% of all healthy individuals will carry Staph aureus in the nose without any awareness or impact. And it won't have any impact on them. It's a very well known type of Staph aureus is MRSA and years gone by MRSA was one of our superbugs, um, but it still has a continuing mortality rate of 28 to 38%, which is still very high. Although we are able to manage um, MRSA much better, it, we are still finding that it's killing lots of patients. So when do we make a microbial um, an analysis? Now, this will vary from trust to trust, so please make sure that you look at your local policy. But um, as a guide, acute wounds with classic symptoms of infection should be swabbed. Chronic wounds with signs of spreading or systemic wound, uh, systemic infections, um, you should do a swab. Any infected wounds that have failed to respond to the antimicrobial dressings um, or are worsening despite that antimicrobial treatment. In compliance, of course, with your local protocol, protocols um, and what your swabs will help you um, determine is what antibiotic it is resistant to. Um, as we've already said, all wounds contain bacteria, so it's not necessarily going to tell you that there's an infection because there's bacteria in it. You need to um, use your clinical judgment and look at what else is going on with your patient. But it's really important that if you think there is an infection in that wound, that you think about treating it there and then and not waiting for the swab results to come back. Any wounds where the presence of certain species would negate a surgical procedure. So um, if your patient is going for skin grafting, we need to make sure that we swab in the skin to make sure that there aren't um, specific types of bacteria present. Because if there are um, specific types of bacteria present, then that skin graft won't take and it will fail. So we've done that assessment. Um, stage of our three-step approach. We've done that full holistic assessment of our patient. We've done our um, uh, used the triangle of wound assessment to um, identify what's happening in our wound bed, edge and peri wound skin. And then we're going to talk next about wound preparation. So slough, slough. non-viable tissue and biofilms can all delay the wound healing process because they increase that risk of infection. They inhibit the development of any healthy tissue and they limit that wound assessment. If your wound is full of slough, non-viable tissue, necrotic tissue or any debris, it's really difficult to see what's going on in your wound bed. Now think about some of your pressure ulcers that you may have looked after, your category threes and fours. Sometimes if they are full of necrotic or sloughy tissue, you have no idea really how deep those wounds are. So this is where wound preparation can really help by reducing your risk of infection. It can help you to actually assess that wound 
um, much easier by removing those barriers to healing. And as we've said, 80% to 100% of non-healing wounds can contain a biofilm. Now, wound preparation can help to reduce biofilm. And so wound preparation is really important to help prepare that wound for healing. There's been um, a study done by Wilcox um, who looked at, uh, I think it was over 300,000 patients um, with regards to wound preparation. And, and what you can see in front of you actually looked at um, nearly 60,000 diabetic patients. Um, and what we what the study found was how important it is to, to cleanse and debride your um, wounds or your patient's wounds before you apply a dressing, because it has massive um, positive results in helping to speed up that wound healing. So if you do debridement or wound preparation once every two weeks, the medium time to heal for a diabetic foot ulcer was 76 days. But if you um, increase your debridement or your wound preparation to once a week, the median time for healing was 21 days, so three times less. Now, I don't know about you, but if we can heal our patients within 21 days, as opposed to 76 days, that's certainly going to give you some time back and your patients are going to be so much happier with you if you can heal them that quickly. Now, a holistic assessment directs wound preparation that includes washing, cleansing and debridement. And um, this is from the best practice recommendations for wound preparation. Um, and so we we look at washing and cleansing, but we also look at the different um, debridement types that, um, that as healthcare professionals we can do. So your autolytic debridement will help. That's basically the body's own way of shedding the devitalised tissue um, by the use of moisture. And we can assist in that by use the dressings that we can use. Um, mechanical debridement is um, that physical removal of devitalised tissue using friction. So in years gone by, this was the wet to dry method. Um, so we put wet gauze on, leave it to dry and then rip it off. Your patients will not thank you for that. Please do not practice this anymore. We now have lovely um, debridement pads such as all prep pad to help us with that mechanical debridement. And it's much easier for healthcare professionals as well. We have biological debridement, so the use of larvae or maggot, maggots, which are grown in a sterile environment. So please don't go um, applying maggots that you find that are homegrown at home. I'm sure many of you have taken down bandages and found that an opportunistic fly has laid its eggs and, and there are now larvae. We must use sterile larvae if we are using it. These will um, basically eat the dead tissue that's in the wound bed. Um, they're brilliant at what they do um, and quite underused. Um, it by healthcare professionals because because of the the cost of them. There is also enzymatic debridement, so this can be where an ointment, a gel, or a dressing containing enzymes can help to soften and lift that necrotic tissue. You must be careful when using these because it can um, often burn um, healthy skin, so you need to be careful how you use these. And then there is um, sharp or surgical debridement, so this is where scalpel, forceps, curette, or scissors can be used to remove those that devitalised tissue. Now this is an extended skill; you need um, a um, extra competencies to be able to do this so please don't all start wielding a knife um, with your patients you must have further training to do this so it will probably be your specialist nurses that carry out this skill but you can all use your mechanical debridement tools such as all prep pad and we'll go through this a little bit in a minute so the international best practice for management of biofilms um, and infection suggests that wound preparation is your number one thing to do to help cleanse and debride and reduce the number of microorganisms by disturbing and removing some of the biofilms. And as you can see here, this is a picture of all prep pad in clinical practice. Um, it has two sides to it, a light grey side and a darker grey side. The darker grey side um, is a little bit more abrasive. The lighter grey side has um, slits in it that can help you collect any of that debris that you have removed from that wound bed. Um, it's nice and easy for um, either healthcare professionals or patients to use. So if you're thinking about patients with self-care or supported self-management, then this is a tool that they could be using themselves. They also suggest infection management and applying a barrier dressing um, to, to the wounds that you are treating with um, an infection. So how often will that wound um, preparation be required? Well, if you think back to the Wilcox study we discussed, the more frequently, the quicker that we can get these patients to heal. 
So it really depends on you as the healthcare professional um, and down to your clinical judgment, um, how often your patient can tolerate it. It could be that you need to work up to tolerating this more frequently, but it's down to your assessment, your clinical judgment, your treatment goals, and, and as I say, the pain levels that the patient um, are able to tolerate. But the more frequently that you can do this, um, hopefully the quicker that patient's wound will heal. And that by, might be something that you need to have in the, in the lines of communication with your patient around why they need to have wound preparation. Too fast again. So it's also important to think about when we need to be cautious with wound preparation. If um, a patient has a wound on their lower limb, so a leg ulcer, and is known to be diabetic or a diabetic foot ulcer, it might be suitable for you to do wound preparation, but you might need to discuss this with a specialist. So it could be that you need to talk to your tissue viability specialist nurse. It could be that you need to talk to a podiatry or vascular if the patients are known to these teams. If patients have known arterial concerns or poor localised tissue perfusion, um, then wound preparation might not be something that you want to do. If there is no blood supply to that area and we start preparing that wound and removing any devitalised tissue, ultimately what we're doing is opening up that wound um, to allow the bacteria in. If there's no, tish if there's no um, tissue perfusion, that wound is not going to heal. So we need to think about how we manage that wound. And again, it could be that you need to speak with your specialist teams to um, get guidance on this. Another thing you need to think about is um, fungating wounds. Um, it's not always appropriate to do wound preparation with fungating wounds. And it could be, again, that you need to get specialists involved um, to decide on the, the, the treatment plan for, the, for these types of patients. But you need to think about what your medications your patients are taking as well and their underlying medical condition, conditions. Sorry, Are they on any cytotoxic medications? So are they on any chemotherapies, radiotherapy? Um, so do we need to be careful about wound preparation? Are they immunosuppressed because of the medications that they're taking? Um, and if so, we need to think about the, the, the treatment and management goals for our patients while they're having these treatments. So we've done our, our holistic assessment, our robust holistic ass assessment of our patient and of the patient's wound. We've done a really good wound preparation for this patient, ensuring that we are preparing and removing those barriers to healing in a, to enable us to create that optimum healing environment ready for that step three, which is our treatment. And that's what we're going to discuss now. So you, when you do your wound assessment and your assessment of your patient, you will start identifying what your treatment objectives are. When you've done that wound preparation, this will also help to clarify what those treatment objectives are. Um, and what we ideally are trying to do is to support an optimum level of healing. So a nice moist wound healing environment for, for our patient. So you need to think about not only is there wound, is there is there infection in that wound, but what else you are looking at for that wound and what you're going to treat. So often with infection, we're going to have increased level of exudate or, uh, or exudate pooling. So it could be that our wound is um creating an awful lot of exudate. So we need to think about how we're going to manage that to prevent any maceration at that wound edge or that periwound skin. And that ties in with the protection of that periwound skin, making sure that we have got a dressing that is suitable to manage the exudate for that patient. OK, by identifying um, the treatment um, and the underlying causes, it's really important to help with that wound healing journey. So make sure that you fully understand what is going on with your patient and that patient's wound, because that will really help with your treatment objectives and, and how we can move that patient into the healing phase. So again, the international best practice for management of biofilms and infection, as I discussed earlier, was number one, wound preparation. Really important to remove those that devitalised tissue, any of those barriers, to reduce any biofilm that may be sat in that wound, but also to apply a barrier dressing and a dressing that can prevent maceration because it manages that exudate appropriately and prevents recontamination. So your biotain silicon AG, as you can see in this, in this picture here, will conform down into that wound bed. So there won't be any exudate pooling because that dressing will absorb that um, exudate vertically, um, but it will also lock away any of the bacteria and the exudate in the outer layer of the dressing. 
but it also has silver built into this dressing and the silver um, some dressings can dump that silver all at once but this is a prolonged release so as long as that dressing is an intact is um, on that patient and intact with that wound it will be releasing silver to help with that wound infection and again infection management so you need to suppress those biofilm formations reduce those existing biofilms that are already there and any microorganisms that are causing problems in that wound bed and a silver dressing can help um, because it has that active agent in that dressing. So when do we need to implement an antimicrobial? And this is around implementing an antimicrobial dressing. Um, you need to think separately about when you need to um, implement your antibiotics or your oral antibiotics and or your IV antibiotics. And we're going to go through these. So your contamination, your colonisation stages, as you remember, um, these are when the wound harbour is harbouring bacteria, but it's not causing the host any problem. We are able as as the patient, as the person to fight off this bacteria. So topical antimicrobial dressings are not indicated because that bio burden is not causing any clinical problems to the patient. Local infection is when we need to start thinking about our topical antimicrobial dressings, and this is when they are indicated. So if you are noticing those localised signs of infection um, at that wound bed edge and periwound skin, then this is when we need to implement an antimicrobial dressing. When your wound is in the spreading infection or the systemic infection, this is when you need to think about systemic antibiotics, so oral or IV antibiotics and a topical antimicrobial dressing. Now, sometimes when patients become systemically unwell, we're very good at treating that systemic infection, but we sometimes forget where that infection originated from. So it's still really important to use an antimicrobial dressing on your patients, even if they are systemically unwell with their infection. Yes, we need to use the IV antibiotics or the oral, but we also need to use that antimicrobial dressing um, as indicated too. So there are many types of antimicrobials available to us um, and they come in many different forms. So they can be liquids, paste, creams, ointment, sprays and impregnated dressings. Now, how you use these um, antimicrobials and the frequency of the application will really depend on the product that you're using. Some are used every day for a short period of time. Some will require you to reapply them several times a day. Um, and in, in this case, this is probably for patients that are on um, supported self-management because you're not going to be able to go in and see your patients several times a day to reapply maybe a paste or a cream to that wound. And then some are left in contact with the wound for several days. So this is a, probably our going to be, we're thinking about our dressings. Now, there are different uh, types of topical antimicrobials available um, that are used in wound management. And some of these include honey, PHMB, iodine and silvers. And some of these have been around for many, many, many years. Um, but they have progressed and um, we are able to use dressings that contain some of these components. Now, I'm going to talk to you about silver. Um, and there is an international consensus around the appropriate use of silver dressings in wounds. Um, and uh, this was this is available um, if you want to go and have a look at it. But topical agents with silver have been used, as I've said, for thousands of years um, to prevent or to treat infections. And it's available in many, um, many forms. So there's a solid form as a solution of silver salt, which is used to clean wounds as a cream or ointment containing silver or antibiotic compounds. Now, silver in its um, jewellery form isn't going to help with infection. So don't all run out and start covering yourselves in silver jewellery because that's not going to help you at all. Um, but in recent years, a wide range of wound dressings containing silver have been developed. They're far easier to apply for healthcare professionals. They're more comfortable for patients. And they, as I said about um, biotane silicon AG, it provides a sustained release of silver and it needs less frequent dressing changes. So this is much better for our patients if they are um, able to manage their own wounds. Um, they can leave that dressing in place. But it's also great for healthcare professionals because it means you don't have to keep going in to see patients every day. You can leave these dressings on um, depending on how frequently you're having to change them because of their exudate. So silver has um, is a real broad spectrum antimicrobial. It is effective against gram negative and gram positive uh, bacteria. So your pseudomonas and your MRSAs, your staph aureuses. And it also shown to help prevent 
biofilm formation in in vitro studies. So it's a triple one years, isn't it? We're looking at both gram negative and gram positive bacteria and also can help prevent those biofilm formations. And how does it work? So um, silver targets multiple sites of bacteria. Basically, what it does is it binds to that bacteria cell wall, blocking anything coming in or coming out of that cell. So it puts up a, a big wall, basically. Nothing can come in and nothing can come out. It also, um, the ions are transported into that bacterial cell where they block that respiratory system. So not only does it block things coming in and out, it then penetrates that cell and suffocates it, basically. It cuts off its respiratory system. And thirdly, um, what it does is it interrupts the, the cell's DNA. Um, so it stops it from replicating. It can no longer multiply. So it has three functions. Now, with the use of antimicrobials, we always use the two week challenge um, and obviously uh, make sure you follow your, your local policies and protocols in relation to this. But what the two week challenge does um, is allows you that two week period to reassess as to whether that antimicrobial is actually working um, for that wound. Now, it doesn't mean put an antimicrobial dressing on and leave it for two weeks. It means continue your dressing regime as you feel um, is clinically, clinically relevant, but make sure that you are reassessing to make sure that that um, antimicrobial is doing everything that you expect it to be doing. And if it's not, do we need to think about using a different antimicrobial? After that two week period, the patient and the management approach can be re-evaluated according to, to the picture that you can see there. It doesn't mean after two weeks that you have to stop using antimicrobial if it's doing what you need it to do and it is reducing those signs of infection in that wound bed, then you can continue to use it, but you need to make sure that you keep reassessing that wound. If after two weeks, the antimicrobial has done exactly what you need it to do and there is no longer an infection in that wound, you can remove the antimicrobial dressing and continue your treatment plan as, uh, as, um, as per your clinical um, opinion. So we're just going to look about how we can make your life easier. So we've talked about the Coloplast three-step approach, this simplifying wound healing with three steps. And I, th I think it's really easy to remember. You assess your patient and their wound, you prepare your patient's wound, and then you treat your patient's wound. And within your treat, not only will you be treating your patient's wound, but you can help with treating any underlying problems that that patient has and any underlying conditions. So we're going to just going to talk um, through um, the three-step approach that was used in clinical practice. Now, this is a case study of Mr. D, and now he's a 55-year-old gentleman, and he had his uh, left hallux or his left big toe um, amputated due to type 2 diabetes and an arterial insufficiency. Now, as you can see, this gentleman's wound after his amputation was not great. And what they were looking at doing for this gentleman was actually amputating his foot further. He was having multiple dressings and daily dressing changes um, to his regime and to manage the exudate levels. Because as you can see, this wound has quite a high exudate level. Now the assessment um, was, um, the full holistic assessment was completed as was the wound assessment. And those management goals were looking at creating that optimal healing environment by preparing that wound bed edge and the peri wound skin. Because as you can see, the wound bed edge and peri wound skin is not looking healthy. So we needed to remove that non-viable tissue in the wound bed at the wound edge. Uh, we needed to manage the exudate because, as you can see, this is quite um, a highly exuding wound. Manage that bacterial burden, protect the granulation tissue and the epithelial tissue that is, um, is in that wound bed and protect that surrounding skin. So we used all prep pad here to prepare that wound and thoroughly prepare that wound. And we used um, biotain silicon AG to treat this wound. And as you can see, there is a massive improvement from day one to 14 weeks later. Now, considering this gentleman um, was, was looking at losing his whole foot, 14 weeks to almost healed is not bad going. So the wound had decreased in size from 18 centimetres by 7 centimetres um, to 4 centimetres by 1 centimetre in just 14 weeks. The top of the toe where the wound um, or the top of the wound, sorry, where the toe was 
had healed, as you can see in, in week 14's picture, the exudate levels um, to the remaining area have reduced massively and there are no signs of localised infection and the patient's pain score is now only 2 out of 10. The wound no longer requires an antimicrobial dressing to manage that bacterial load and now is being treated with biotain silicon. So as you can see, three simple steps, assess, prepare and treat and how effective that can be for a patient that potentially was about to lose his foot. Um, so that 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 assessment so important to find out what your management goals are for that wound, but your preparation um, using a tool such as Allpet Pad and cleansing and debriding that wound is really important to make sure that that treatment, so the biotain silicon AG, was effective in what we needed it to do. So three simple steps, and look at the the outcomes that that can have for you. So we also have the wound infection pathway, again, a simplified wound healing approach. Um, and this is something that you can implement in your areas um, if you don't have a wound infection pathway. So it's a simplified pathway. It starts with looking at the um, patient as a whole. So look at your um, holistic assessment and then look at your wound assessment of your wound bed, edge and peri wound skin. And then it goes on to ask whether that wound is infected. If it is, it asks you whether this is a local infection or a spreading infection. If this is a local infection, you need to go um, down to the bottom box where it says to prepare that wound for healing and consider treatment objectives. So your wound preparation is important and then refer to the product selection guide, which we'll go on to in a moment, for your two week challenge with an antimicrobial treatment. If the wound is, or if the patient has spreading or systemic infection, you need to be thinking about whether this patient has sepsis. They need an urgent medical review. So you probably need to get this patient into hospital. Um, you may need the tissue viability team whilst they're in hospital to review that patient. And you, um, there is, you can have a look at the international wound infection best practice recommendations for the signs and symptoms of spreading or systemic infection and appropriate actions that need to be taken. If the wound is not infected and is progressing as expected, then um, you've got granulation tissue to your wound bed, continue your treatment plan as is. If the wound is not progressing as you expect, could it be that there is actually biofilm in this wound? And again, you would need to then um, look at wound preparation and your two week challenge with antimicrobial treatment. If the wound isn't progressing as expected, uh, sorry, if the wound is progressing as expected, but there is slough or de and or devitalised tissue to your wound bed, then you need to, to, again, think about wound preparation, removing those barriers to healing, and then refer to the product selection guide, which I will um, talk you through in a moment. So this is the product selection guide that we have at Coloplast. Step one, again, is we're following the three-step approach. Assess the, wound, the, the patient and the wound using the wound infection pathway as we've just gone through. Step two, um, use your wound preparation tool. So here we have all prep pad to help remove those um, barriers to healing or follow your local guidance on this. And then step three is your treatment. So you've prepared that wound ready for that treatment. So if the wound is quite superficial, you could use biotain silicon AG or biotain AG non-adhesive, um, depending on whether you need that um, uh, the silicon adhesive to help that, that dressing to stick or whether you're going to be putting it under bandages, you might not, you might need the non-adhesive. If your wound is 0 to 2 centimetres in depth, then you can use your biotain silicon AG or your biotain AG non-adhesive. And remember, um, the biotain silicon AG will conform to the wound bed up to two centimetres. If, if your wound is more than two centimetres in depth, then you might need to pack this wound with a biotain alginate AG and then use a biotain silicon or a biotain non-adhesive. You do not need to use a biotain silicon AG if you were using a biotain alginate AG because you're already getting that silver from the alginate. You can just use a biotain silicon over that as your secondary dressing. Now, if your wound is not two centimetres but has undermining or tunnelling, you will also need to use um, an, an alginate dressing or an alginate AG, AG dressing to, to fill those gaps, basically. So at, where that undermining is or where that tunnelling is, that we may need to pack those areas um, and then again use a biotain silicon or a biotain um, non-adhesive as your secondary dressing for, for to cover that um, wound. So that brings us to the end of our um, assess, prepare, treat of wound infection. 
Um, I'm just going to make you aware of a couple of events that are coming up. So next week on the 16th um, of January, we have the National Virtual Coroner's Courts where we are looking at leg ulcers. And my um, my colleague Sam Wharton and Janice Bianchi will be um, um, doing this uh, webinar. It's 10 a.m. to 12.30 um, p.m., so 10 a.m. till lunchtime. And you can sign up to this if you go um, onto the um, uh, Coloplast website and um, look at the webinar section, or you can scan the QR code that is on your screen. We will be repeating this wound infection um, module on the 17th of January, and this is at the earlier time of 10 o'clock. But we also have skin tears in February and pressure ulcers in March. And today we have also launched our Wound Care Conversations podcasts. So you can find this on, um, on Spotify or any of the podcast um, platforms if you'd like to have a listen. Um, again, we're talking about assess, prepare, treat and how we can make your life easier looking at different wound etiologies. Um, so please share this with your colleagues if, if podcast is something that they they um, enjoy listening to. Uh, any questions, Sam or Ellen? Hi, Charlie. Yeah, yeah the, the chat's, chat's been really good. Yeah, silent. Yeah, silent. Yeah, silent. Is that it? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, no, some really good uh, conversations in the chat. Um, a few people haven't heard of the All Prep Pad, so please go on to Call of Plus Professionals um, and look that up. And if you need any additional support, um, please reach out to uh, the Call of Plus team um, and we're more than happy to, to give you more information. Um, a lot about that wound preparation. Again, just reiterating the importance of that wound preparation stage. Um, Again, some good questions about silver dressings. Um, and again, it's it's all about ensuring that you know how your products work um, and ensuring that you're using them correctly. Um, and again, if you need more information about the Biotain Silicon AG, please go to Coloplast Professionals or reach out to uh, your Coloplast team that um, support or cover your area. Um, so yeah, some very good chat. Brilliant. Good. So I'd just like to um, thank you all for joining us this evening and, and taking time out of your, your evening. Uh, we really appreciate it and we do hope that um, you have enjoyed the session um, and will join us again in the future for further sessions. Charlie, thank we've you. got somebody oh, yeah. um, from West Lancashire who's got her hand up. Um, oh. So Diane, uh, if you're able to come on audio, I don't know if you're able to come on audio to ask your question. Oh, we've got a couple of questions. Hang on, uh, Diane, I'm just going to unmute you. There we go, Diane, you should be able to speak to us now. Gonna Hello. Let us... Me. Hello. Hi, um, just a, a quick question, please. Um, I understand, obviously, that your brand is the Coloplast, um, but if, as many others have said, if it's not on our formulary, um, <clears throat> And, and I think some of us have got different AGs um, that we've got in our formulary. Um, that's not something that's in our hands. I'm a band five and in a community nurse, and, and that's not in, in my hands what we have in our formulary. Um, and I understand, obviously, that you would promote the brands that you guys do, but is there a way in which we can still understand more about the, I mean, the, the, Discussion on silver was very well put out there, Charlie. I just want to say thank you for that. It was very clear and, and informative. But um, I suppose just what advice have you got for those of us who don't have these things that you, you're recommending? So um, your your wound preparation can be done with whatever mechanical debridement tool you're using, whether that is a tool, whether it is all prep pad or whether it's a, a, a different tool. But it can also you can also use your gauze and saline to yeah. do that. You just need to disrupt that wound bed and try and remove those barriers um, that, that are causing that wound to stay in stay static. And again, your your silvers use or your antimicrobials whatever is available to you on your formularies mm. um that they will have um similar qualities um and so you will still be able to use those um for, for your patients so it's 
yes, I, I am going to talk about all prep pad and biotain silicon AG, but whatever is local on your former formery for your wound preparation and then for your antimicrobial usage is absolutely fine to use for your for your patients. Is there a way in which I can um uh, I'm trying to think how to put it, um, have someone from Coloplast, um, how, how would I go about, you know, if, if we want, if I wanted to promote what I've heard tonight um, in with myself and my, my organisation, um, how do I go about doing that? Because it's so, not on the formulary, as I say, and I don't have the power. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> five, so, I don't have that power. <laughs> oh, bless you. So if you go on to Coloplast pro Professional, excuse me, all the product information is on there. So you could use that um, to show um, your, your band sixes, your band sevens, your tissue viability team, if they're not aware of it. But you could also get in touch with your local Coloplast representative um, for, the, for, for your area. Um, and somebody could arrange to come and speak to you about those. OK, that's yeah. great. Thank you Sorry, so much. Sorry, Charlie. I was just going to jump in to say that there will be a follow up um, from Coloplast with everybody who's joined the webinar today um, to be in touch and and see how, and ask how you found the webinar. Um, so we can okay. make contact that way as well and arrange for somebody to come and see you or talk to you. OK, that's brilliant. I will raise it with our TVNs um, when I see them just to say how great I found it. I've actually texted my, one of my TVNs tonight just to say... <laughs> <laughs> this is great thank you for encouraging me to find these webinars so yeah really great Brilliant. thank you thank you for the question i think we've got another question as well from is it joanne melville just going to allow your mic joanne are you there can i let you talk to me are you there joanne it looks like she's still muted. Oh, here she is. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. Good evening. Um, that was really very informative, and I've learned things that I probably would not have known before. And also, because I'm an agency nurse, uh, but works very regularly with a particular team here in North London, and um, you know, I've I've got so much information. I couldn't really keep up with you a lot. I was trying to make some notes as well. What I want to know is, is these notes available for us for future reference? Yeah, so um, a, a copy of the recording will be sent to you um, so that you can watch that back. Um, and a copy of the pathway will also be sent to you along with a certificate um, for CPD hours. Okay, um, yes. um, in the next couple of days. Thank you so much. Keep up what you're doing because it's been very, very informative. I really was stuck in with it and you really held my attention. Um, I'm going to just continue looking at your webinars as well for the future. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Welcome. And then I think we've got Cheryl Silic. I'm sorry if I'm saying these wrong. I think I've unmuted you, Cheryl. Are you there, Cheryl? Is it not letting you speak? Um, yeah. Possibly you, you've answered a question, Charlie. Hello, Mike. OK, no. no, brilliant. Well, thank you all for joining us um, and for staying a little bit later than the eight o'clock. Uh, we really appreciate it and we uh, we hope you have taken a lot from today. And please do come back and join us um, for for the coroner's courts and the, 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 the webinars that we are doing monthly. Um, we we'll hope to see you again soon. Thank you.